Welcome to Modern Tactical Shooting. This video is all about why the SCAR in 5.56 or the Mark 16 was not adopted by Special Forces. Now this video is not based on deep internet research. It's actually based on first-hand experience by me because I took part in the final trials for this rifle back in 2007. So let's go. So before I cover why this gun was actually not selected by Special Operations, let me go into a little bit of the background. I first heard about this rifle as a young 18 Bravo back in 2005. We basically got a bunch of information flyers on it, basically saying we we're going to be getting a new rifle that would be multiple caliber and that we could swap barrels out and it would have some improved features over the M4, like an off-rod system similar to an AK. So initially we we're all pretty excited, you know, to learn about this new gun that we're going to be getting. So the SCAR, in my opinion, is the perfect example of what happens when you have strictly engineers and gun designers overseen by basically non-gun guys develop a rifle, meaning that the input by shooters and subject matter experts on small arms and basically experienced operators and SF guys did not come till the very end of the actual testing phase of this gun, I think had experienced shooters and operators been involved in the design of this gun from the very beginning we may have very well seen this rifle adopted and a lot of changes i think would have been made to this rifle and we would see a different scar 556 today so why do i say this because on paper the scar in 556 actually sounds like a great platform it has a side folding buttstock like an ak has an op rod like an ak so that enhanced reliability as a quick change barrel system, basically not super quick change, but it does have the ability to swap out different length barrels. So on paper, this gun makes a lot of sense, but as we found in testing, a lot of the you know features of this gun are actually lacking when it came to shootability and reliability. So a perfect example of something that sounds good on paper, but in application actually really didn't work out well, is the reciprocating charging handle on the SCAR. This is actually a special operations requirement. And again, I think it's because non-gun guys were just looking at other guns, such as the AK, for instance, and they were thinking, okay, the, one of the reasons why the AK is super reliable, it has that bolt handle that goes back and forth, you know, super simple design. But the AK bolt handle, which I will show on my M90 here, is basically a tab that's just welded or machined onto the bolt carrier itself. And whether you're a lefty or right-handed shooter, the length of travel is really not that long and it's well behind the shooter's hands. It's not up front of the gun. It's not in the way of optics or anything. It's super simple. And this is a bolt handle really, not a charging handle. So they write the requirements that they want a reciprocating bolt handle, I think to mimic the AK, but to me, there's a difference between a bolt handle and a charging handle. This is a bolt handle, and like on the AR, this is a charging handle. This is a whole separate item uh, that you know engages with the bolt carrier. Like on the Tavor that's behind me, that has a separate charging handle. So on paper, it sounded cool to have a reciprocating charging handle, but as I will go, go into, in reality, this is actually one of the worst features on this rifle. So before I actually cover, you know, what was looked at in this gun that made it not be selected by Special Operations, despite the fact that Special Operations had specifically ordered this type of gun, I need to get into or go over the context of the trials. Now in 2007, I was a member of our primary CQB marksmanship committee at Fort Bragg, basically the center point for close quarters combat for Special Operations or Special Forces. I was actually the head flat range instructor at the time. So anything under small arms fell under my purview. And as far as the trials were concerned, uh, my job was to compile all the you know remarks and notes made by the guys after our two week trial period of testing out this gun. And the trial was not set up to be a, let's try out the gun to see if there's any other improvements before we order it. At this point in the trial in 2007, it was, was this gun capable of replacing the M4A1 or not? All the, you know, t and &E and all the research had already been done, been done at that point. And Special Operations Command or Special Forces Command 
wanted to know if this gun was suitable of replacing the M4. So that was the context and the intent of the trial was not to look for any improvements, but to really see if this gun was better than the M4A1 in actual shooters and operation members' hands. And the committee I was a part of was made up really of the best of the best. You had to have a certain amount of time in Special Forces and a certain amount of time in the CRIF or SIF at the time. Uh, Commander's Response Force, Commander's Interdiction Force basically are, you know, anti-terrorist hostage rescue type Special Forces teams. Or you had to have a lot of real world CQB experience to work there. Plus you would have had to have actually passed this course that we taught to be qualified to even teach there. So it was really the cream of the crop when it came to experienced Special Forces operators. And again, I think had we had been able to make some input at the beginning of this process in the early 2000s with the development of this rifle and not at the very end, we would have seen this gun, I think, being adopted and a much better version of the SCAR overall. Now for this trial, we basically got the SCAR lights for a two week period. And the purpose of our evaluation and testing was not to, you know, put it in drop tests and sand tests and ice tests. You know, all that stuff had been done already. We were there literally to just, you know, test out the shootability and the feasibility of this rifle in real world conditions as much as we could mimic. And we basically had a two week block to run this rifle through all the same drills, courses of fire and training that we normally conduct with the M4A1 at the time. And this scar, as I get into it, is a little bit different than the scars that we had in 2007. So all the, you know, things I'm going to highlight about the scar is based on 2007. Since then, FN has actually done a good thing and they have made some changes, which some of them are in this rifle right here. And some they have not actually fixed, but I'll get into that. So one last thing before I cover why the SCAR in 5.56 was not selected by Special Forces. Let me give a big shout out to Shooter Supply in Fayetteville, North Carolina, just outside of Fort Bragg. They actually loaned me this SCAR SBR for this video. I've mentioned Shooter Supply before. They're a great gun store staffed by uh, men and women. A lot of them are ex-military and a lot of them compete in shooting matches so you get a base of experience they are both the tactical side and competitive shooting side so when it comes to gun sales and accessories they're not just going to try and push a gun on you to make a sale they'll actually you know try their best to hone you in on the best firearm you may be looking for and also shooter supply anytime there's any sort of charity to support soldiers and their families fallen soldiers shooter supply has always been more than happy to throw product in support of anything soldier related so big thanks to shooters and again thank you for loaning this rifle i'll provide a link to shooter supply down in the description okay so without further ado let's get into our findings that we discovered during the trials of the scar light back in 2007 now, right out the gate, even before we got down to the flat range to shoot these guns, the first issue or problem we noticed with the SCAR light was the buttstock latch button. The, the button that came on these guns that we got in 2007 was super dismal and super weak, meaning that we could just simply hold the SCAR on your shooting side if you're a righty and bang it against the side of your body and the gun, the buttstock would easily fold in half. It was a super dismal, weak plastic button and spring. Now it appears FN has since then fixed the issue with the weak button. I tried banging this around just a little bit and I could not get the buttstock to fold in half and it's got some good tension on it. But the version we had in 2007 was not uh, suitable for you know duty use. Now the next item that a lot of guys had problems with is the reciprocating charging handle. Now I know this was an actual requirement by special forces in the design of this gun, but again, I think that requirement was made by non-gun guys. So the first issue we have with the reciprocating charging handle is ergonomics. It's the worst placed reciprocating charging handle of any gun I've ever handled and most guys would agree with me. The problems we've had with this reciprocating charging handle placement is whether you charge the weapon palm up 
or palm down, it is a knuckle buster. If you have any optics, especially the EOTech that sticks out on the sides, when you charge this rifle, your knuckle of your hand is gonna get raked across those optics and cut up. So not a very pleasant design. I know there's an angled version that's been out for a while now. That's an attempt to fix this issue. But again, I think the placement of this charging handle is one of those things that had shooters with a lot of experience, had input early on into the design, that something would have been you know, noticed right away is the horrible placement of the charging handle as your hand is gonna rub on any optic that you have up on here. Now the second issue with the charging handle, the reciprocating charging handle is actually a serious one as it is the first knock against its reliability. So the other issue with the charging handle uh, being reciprocating, again, it was a requirement that SF wanted, is if you put your hand in the way of this charging handle at all during the firing and cycling process as it's going back and forth, just with hand placement alone, I'm a lefty, if you have your hand too far back and you interrupt this charging handle while it's cycling, you can actually stop the weapon from working meaning the bolt, bolt carrier won't seat fully forward if you have your hand too far back. And what we found out when we were doing stuff like Kyle Lamb's uh, nine shot drill on his VTAC barricade, when you stick this rifle through certain size ports, again, if you bump this charging handle on the cover while you're shooting, you can cause a stoppage as it will interfere with the you know back and forth in the loading and cycling chambering firing process of this rifle. Very finicky on the 5.56 version. Now with the SCAR Heavy, the Mark 17, the rifle really does not have that problem because the increased recoil and pressure of that large 7.62 round is gonna knock your hand out of the way and it's a lot harder to jam up. But the problem on the 5.56 gun was very apparent that again, uh, very soft cycling and it's easy to trip up this reciprocating charging handle. So the first knock towards its reliability was the reciprocating charging handle, something that is not present on an M4A1. You can stick an M4 all the way through any type of barrier hole, all the way to the magazine well, and it's not gonna trip the gun up in firing. Uh, not so much so with the scar light. Uh, again, if you touch this on any make contact on a barrier, you can trip up the cycling process. So that was a knock towards reliability reciprocating charging handle. Now the next flaw we had with the SCAR light was actually a major one and it identified a brand new issue that we had never seen before that exists only with the SCAR in 5.56 and that is a new type of jam which was created by double feeds and triple feeds which of course a double feed or a triple feed is created by bad magazines. When the followers start going bad it allows extra rounds to slip up into the gun. So the initial cause is not a knock against a scar, it's just that if you use poor quality magazines, whereas you might get a double feed with an AR, which can be cleared pretty quickly, and even a triple feed with the proper technique and without tools, as I've shown in a previous video, which I'll put a link down in the description, you can clear a triple feed or a round over the bolt in 30 seconds or less. But in, with the case of the scar, Rounds would actually, with a triple feed, that third round would slip up into the actual op rod channel of the gun and get stuck up in there. And one of two things would happen. Either the round would jam up the op rod and the gun would cease to function. And the only way to get that stuck case out is to take the gun apart. And as you can see in this photo here, I recreated it at the time with a training round and I was able to slip that round up into the op rod channel with finger pressure only, just to show how rounds can slip up in there. Or another thing would happen is spent cases or live rounds would go up into the op rod channel, channel. They wouldn't stop up the gun, but I remember very distinctly, we had one of the guys, when he took his gun apart, he had four cases floating around in the op rod channel of his scar. And the reason why this was happening is the op rod the small dimension of the op rod and the large channel that it flowed in had space allowing cases or live rounds to slide up in there if there was a double or triple feed extra round slipping up into the chamber. Now on this rifle here, I tried to recreate it and that is an issue that I heard FN had fixed after the trials that we had conducted. 
and it seems very apparent on this gun. I could not slide a round up into the op rod channel with finger pressure. It seems they've increased the diameter of the op rod so that would not happen. Now with the SCAR 17 in 7.62 or 308, that was never an issue because the op rod on the 7.62 gun is a lot thicker. And the case, of course, the 7.62 round or 308 round is a lot bigger than a 5.56, so there's never enough room for that round to slip up in there. So it's an issue the SCAR Heavy has never had. It only existed with the SCAR 5.56, and that was another major knock towards the reliability of this rifle, which you know led to it not being selected, is it had created a whole new class of jam that we were calling literally round in the op rod chamber. And again, the only way to get those rounds out is to take the gun apart. And that's, you know, something that we found very unacceptable with the Scarlet at the time is you have a new style of jam that forces you to take the gun apart. You know, that would not be good to have that happen in combat. So that was probably the biggest knock towards this gun not being selected at the time was rounds slipping up into the op rod chamber. Now, again, rounds slipping up into the op rod chamber of the Scarlet was not a scar issue, it's a bad magazine issue, but you can't, you know, just say, okay, use, you know, brand new mags forever with the scar. That doesn't happen. Guys are gonna use what mags they want, and once in a while, you know, mags do wear out, mags do go bad over time, so that's something you can't risk uh, putting in your weapon, especially in combat, is to have a gun that completely stops working and you have to take apart. I can't emphasize this enough that that was one of the major issues of why this weapon was not selected by special forces. One more thing that was noted during the trials, and again, we had about two weeks with this rifle and we shot thousands of rounds of M855 through these rifles and M193, which is 55 grain ball, is the lower rail, which is permanently affixed to the barrel, gets super hot. Now that's no big deal if you're a civilian shooter and you go to the flat range, you're shooting two or three mags and you take a break or you take this gun out to a gun match. Typically gun matches, you go out and you fire maybe one or two mags on a stage and then you wait up to 30 to 40 minutes to shoot your next course of fire. But on a military gun, this thing, this uh, lower bottom rail, which is all metal, gets extremely hot super fast. So whereas you can take an M4A1 and plow through three or four mags on full auto, it's gonna be hot that handguard, but we're talking this thing, in one or two mags, it got just as hot as an M4 in three or four mags. So uh, it wasn't a deal breaker with the gun, but it was something we noted, just a bad design of having an all metal bottom rail permanently affixed to the barrel. So no matter what barrel you put on this gun, it has this all metal rail that it gets very hot very quickly. Now the last point of contention with this rifle is really a small one and it's only going to affect a small amount of shooters, but it is something that I noticed and that's because I am a lefty, is this tab that sticks out here in the buttstock is actually has a kind of a sharp edge to it and it seems that FN has not fixed it because it's still present. And as a left-handed shooter, uh, when I put this up to my cheek to shoot the gun, it does start rubbing you raw, this little tab right here. Uh, again, it's no big deal for a civilian shooter if you're going out and you're shooting a few mags out in the flat range and you're taking a lot of breaks. But, you know, in the military, we can do six or seven hours on the flat range and shoot hundreds and hundreds of rifle rounds. So to have this little tab as a lefty rub on you, that gets old pretty fast. And it was something that was noted as kind of, you know, maybe you redesign this. But uh, it seems that FN has indeed not fixed this. So as a lefty, uh, you might find this is going to rub you raw right here. So there it is. Those are the items or the flaws that we found with the SCAR light, the Mark 16 at the time. Now, all our findings were compiled into one report, which I helped put together along with the photos, which I've included here. They were actually copies of photos that went up. And this went to General Mulholland. Now, if that name sounds familiar, he was portrayed in the movie 12 Strong as the fifth group commander at the time during the initial invasion of Af Af Afghanistan, which I was a member of fifth special forces group at the time. I did not participate in the initial invasion of Afghanistan, but I knew him when he was Colonel Mulholland. And later on, when he was Major General Mulholland in 2007, he was in charge of all US Army special forces. We compiled a final report and literally I sat in on the meeting where he talked about the attributes of this rifle and basically it was deemed that this was not better than the M4A1 
and therefore guys did not feel the need to switch to the SCAR as it did not have any significant improvements over the M4 to you know warrant its you know replacement of the M4 and put into combat use. So there you have it. Those are the major reasons. Again, specifically this reciprocating charging handle being kind of finicky. If you bump it, you can jam up the gun. And the big one was at the time, rounds could go up into the op rod channel and jam up the guns. Those are two big knocks towards its reliability. And honestly, that's why this was not selected. Now, later on, I think it was 2008, 2009, Ranger Regiment did opt to give the SCAR light in 5.56 to honest, you know, go at it. They did adopt the rifle for about a two year period, but they eventually did go back to the M4A1 also. So that just means that we were correct in our assessment. I think that this gun was not fit to replace the M4A1. You know, we tried it for two weeks, put thousands of rounds through these guns, but the Rangers gave it a go for two years and even they went back to the M4A1. So they even, I guess, agreed with us that this was not a, you know, suitable replacement for the M4A1. It offered, you know, nothing more than the M4A1 could offer. Now in 2010, Special Operations Command did purchase a few hundred SCAR lights and I don't remember exactly which barrel length it was. Uh, it was a 12 and a half or 14 and a half inch barrel. Here's a picture of me using one in 2010 for a train up. Now the intent of the purchase was, was to send these rifles, basically forward deploy them downrange throughout the Middle East. So, you know, guys could go down range uh, if they were, you know, in onesies or twosies or small teams, instead of bringing all their guns with them, they could basically sign one of these out for personal protection. The SCAR lights were not meant to be used in frontline combat use, but more of as a personal defense weapon if you just needed a rifle for personal protection uh, during your deployment with whatever Middle Eastern country you're in. We specifically uh, got these. I did do a deployment. I was around 2011 in the Middle East. We were issued them because we were traveling low level, meaning in civilian clothes, and they thought it would be a good idea to have a rifle with a folding buttstock since it is more compact than the M4. It's more compact in this configuration, but again, as you can see here in the picture, we did not get issued the super shorty barrel. So even though the idea was a super compact gun to keep in your civilian car, we had the longer barrels making the gun not as compact as it could be. So uh, that was kind of lame, if I may say so myself. But I did roll with a SCAR light on one deployment. It was mainly a personal protection weapon, as you can see in the photos. I ran an LCAM 1-4 to optic on there, and it was the first time I was using an offset red dot, which later on, that same red dot and mount was on my M4A1 through all three of my combat deployments. I still have it to this day. But I did have a SCAR light for one deployment. Real quick on the magazines, the SCAR did come with its own proprietary 5.56 magazine, which is actually not that bad of a design, but it is heavier than a standard aluminum 5.56 magazine. Uh, not as heavy as, you know, the HK all steel magazine, but it is a little bit heavier and guys did not really care for it and it wasn't used a whole lot. A lot of guys stuck with the classic at the time Gen 2 P mag, we had thousands of these in our unit, but this did bring out another issue later on during my 2011 deployment that we noted when using the Gen 2 P mag, which I'll get into right now. So the problem that was identified with the Gen 2 P mag is the bolt catch inside the gun has a left offset, meaning the tab that actually engages the follower on the magazine to make the gun lock back when empty. It's offset to the left. And as you can see from this photo here, when the mag is inserted into the rifle, even when it's loaded with ammunition, it slightly pushes up on that bolt catch, causing the bolt catch to rub against the bolt carrier during the entire cycling process. Now, this doesn't stop the gun up, but it has potential wear down that bolt catch. So maybe after thousands of rounds, it will not work anymore, but that is something we noted. And the reason why this was happening is if you check out the back of the Gen 2 P mag is a lot more, you know, rounded than, you know, a typical square cut aluminum magazine. 
such as on the my HK steel mag and on this Gen 3 P mag. Of course, they fixed the problem, but at the time, you know, Gen 2 P mags were the go-to mag, uh, and it's just something we noted. And of course, Magpul has since then fixed it, but a fix FN could have done at the time is used a center offset bolt catch. So personally, what do I think about the Scar Light and 556? Uh, well, one, FN has fixed, you know, the major issue with this gun, which is rounds cannot get up in the charging handle chamber anymore. So that's really a non-issue. Personally, I'm still not a fan of this reciprocating charging handle. I know FN has their latest models. This does not go back and forth anymore. It's a non-reciprocating charging handle. But still, the placement is dismal. Uh, I, I don't like it. And another thing I really don't like about the SCAR is this increased height above bore. When you mount an optic on here, it's basically sitting up a, an inch or two higher than your optics on an AR. So much so that uh, I created at the time when we first got issued that SCAR light for my 2011 deployment, I created a new zero target so we could have a 25 yard zero target that gave us a 200 yard point of aim point of impact. And if you look at these photos here, it's about an in, in, uh, inch difference or an increase in an inch of an M4A1 target with that same 25 yard zero, giving you a 200 yard point of aim point of impact. So there you have it. It all came down to shootability and reliability under the actual conditions in which the rifle was intended to be used. And I again, had shooters with a lot of experience, a lot of seasoned operators, if, I think if they were given input in early on into the design of this rifle and not at the end, I definitely think we would have seen a better version of the SCAR being adopted by Special Forces and we'd be using that today instead of the M4. All right, I hope you found this video informative and entertaining. Again, that is the reasons why the SCAR was not adopted by Special Forces, the SCAR in 5.56. Again, I was there, I was part of the final trials, and again, it just didn't make the cut in reliability. So as always, enough watching me. Go out, get your shoot on at the range. As always, I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.